everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. So here are the facts. If you are a single black woman between 20 and 39 and have a bachelor's degree, your net worth is a negative $11,000 to $0 compared to your white counterpart whose net worth ranges from $3,400 to $7,500. And it doesn't get any better if you're married. Again, with a bachelor's degree between the ages of 20 and 39, black women's median net worth, a negative $20,500 to $7,500. 700, while married white women are worth 17, 18, seven to $97,000. Sadly, the gap increases the older you get. So what's the deal with the lack of wealth in the black community? What does it say about our relationship with money? The Another View Roundtable is here, and the conversation is all about the Benjamins. But first, let's head over to Pledge Central to talk about dollars for Another View. Danny Epperson and Nancy Rogan, how you doing? Doing great, Barbara. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Yeah. Now, I understand we have a $2,000 challenge within this hour. Your dollars will be matched dollar for dollar up to $2,000. And our Another View audience always comes through. Yes, yes. We need to, need to make sure the station has the funding it takes to keep Another View coming to you for another year. Absolutely. Yes. Great programming. Barbara Hanley, every Friday at noon on WHRV FM. You rely on that programming, and the only way that programming can continue is with your ongoing support. And what better way to show it than to double it today for that $2,000 challenge that we've got going on until 1 o'clock today, all through another view. Exactly. And the number is um, 1-800-940-NO. Is yep. it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got, you got it. it. You got right it. Seven one seven zero. That's the right number. <laughs> that's right. And, and hey, Barbara, all the phones are busy right now. Oh, that's so fantastic. Just, just that's we are, fantastic. We, all of our phone operators, but that doesn't mean that you can't get in when you give us a call at one eight hundred nine four zero seven one seven zero or hey, go online to whro.org and you uh-huh. can donate and get your donation in and help keep another view going strong for another year. And that's fantastic. And you know what, um, Danny and uh, Nancy, let me let you know and let our listeners know that we have our Another View Roundtable on today, the award-winning Another View Roundtable. And all of the members of the roundtable, including myself, we are all members of WHRV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we believe in our programming. You know, Lisa and Todd, uh, our producer and audio engineer, are also members and so we want you to join our family. Come join us. 1-800-940-7170. That's the number to call. It only takes a few minutes, and we appreciate your support. That's right. You've got until 1 o'clock today during this hour to have your donation matched by another donor out there who values another view and this station, WHRV, just as much as you do. So, no, working together, you can double the strength of your gift and, That's right. and theirs. And we'll be and, and Barbara will be here every Friday at 12 o'clock, and you've got till <laughs> 1 p.m. to have your donation matched. <laughs> WHRO gives you something new to discuss every single day, and Barbara Hamley every Friday makes that happen. Now, we try our very best to make that happen, and uh, we appreciate hearing from our audience. You know, we get a lot of of, uh, show suggestions from people. They call in. They give us ideas. Um, they tell us what they think about the show. Some people, you know, have very strong opinions about what they think about the show, and that's a good thing. That is a wonderful thing. One eight hundred nine four zero seven one seven zero whrv dot org. Either way, double your money. You know, so if you give a hundred dollars, that's two hundred dollars up to two thousand dollars. And we appreciate the uh, donor who um, who gave us the challenge. So and we're you know, looking forward to meeting know, that. Barbara, one of the things I really enjoy, too, as well with Another View, are those positive pieces, you know, that, that you have that Lisa produces. <laughs> yes. I <laughs> love them. You know, because it, it's, a, it's a great way. You have such a great discussion. And then, you know, you turn around with something at the end that just leaves you with a, with a great feeling at the end of the program, well, you like know, you always do. You know, Danny, it was very interesting. When we started Another View 11, more than 11 years ago, wow. uh, in including our time on television, the one thing that our advisory group said to us was that we always want to hear something positive happening in the black community. And we have kept that 
that promise the entire 11 years that we've been on the air. And so it's very, very important to us. We call them selected shorts now. And Lisa Godley is the one who goes out into the field and finds those little gems, things that are happening that people are unaware um, that are going on in our community to help make our community a better community, not only for African Americans, but for everyone. And so that's the thing that we like to promote on Another View. We talk about issues from an African American perspective, but we really try to put it in the context of why it matters to all of us and why all communities are important. So, and let me tell you this too. Pledge is important, so call 1-800-940-7170. Match those dollars. We're getting ready to start the show in a little less than uh, 30 seconds, so... That's right. We're working on that goal here in Pledge Central. We'll be taking your calls here of support all through Another View, all the way until the 1 o'clock hour, of course, to meet that challenge. That's right. You can call 1-800-940-7170 or go online, whrv.org, and donate. Thank you so much, you guys. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so much to those of you who have already made your pledge of support for Another View. Your pledge dollars pay for our programming and ensure that we are with you every Friday at noon. You can call right now, 1-800-940-7170, and tell the volunteer that you are calling for Another View. We have a $2,000 challenge, which means your pledge will be matched dollar for dollar up to $2,000. So give us us a call now. And speaking of dollars, our Another View Roundtable is here, and we're talking about creating black wealth. Please welcome relationship expert and host of the Lion's Den, heard on WHOVFM, Ms. Alvian Lyons. How you doing, Alvian? I am great. <laughs> I'm excited because we're talking about stuff I care about. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> She's the money lady for the city of Norfolk, city treasurer Don Hester. How you doing, Don? I am marvelous. <laughs> Good. Thank you for being here. Carol Pretlow is a political science professor at Norfolk State University. How are you, Carol? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And Allison Moore, who came up with our show topic today, is an entrepreneur and a comedian, and she represents our millennial perspective on the show. Hey, Allison. Hey, y'all. Hey. You know what? That last month, Allison said... uh, I'm going to have, y'all going to have more to introduce me as. So I thought of some more stuff. Oh, I wouldn't have gotten a whole paper for you to do. <laughs> I had a whole article. <laughs> Business Insight, Daily She's Press. For you we saw you. Some stuff. <laughs> right, we got to say something better than this. <laughs> and it was good. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you. I only paid uh-huh. her. No, I'm just kidding. It was. It she was. did a great job. She, she, she was able to, I like writers, but she was able to put all of that information. Yeah. It would have taken me 16 books to say what she said. <laughs> it was a wonderful article. Yeah, thank you. We're very, very proud thank of you. you. Thank you. I was proud of myself. I was like, oh, shoot. That is me. <laughs> <laughs> that is nice. Okay, so listen up, ladies. So in 1 Timothy 6.10, mm. says, mm. for the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh-huh. Oh, God. Soul singer Barrett Strong in his Motown hit, Money, That's What I Want, says, quote, your loving gives me such a thrill, but your love don't pay my bills. <laughs> and a universal saying among black mothers, Quote, when we get in this store, don't touch nothing. (laughs) So what is our attitude? (laughs) What is the black community's attitude about money? (laughs) <laughs> Don, let's start with you since oh, you deal with money every day, every day. <laughs> because I'm the collector that's of right the funds. The 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 funds. <laughs> um, what is well it, it depends on where you which perspective you come from based on how you are taught we have so many families who haven't been taught um, one how to stay out of debt how to save for what you want, how to prepare financially for what you know is coming because you have to pay it. And don't just get credit cards and use credit cards and live off credit cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to save for what you need. You've got to save for emergencies. And I believe that because so many families are struggling is a part of why they get into so much um, debt. Debt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's debt because of health. 
And so they've got those bills. And then, of course, debt for those who are trying to get that next level of education. Mm -hmm. And you've got your college debt. Mm -hmm. And so that changes how 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 we are able to decide what we do next, whether we marry, whether we purchase a home. So there's just so many variables, but it starts at the beginning. But if mama and daddy haven't gotten or received that foundation and taught it to you as you have grown, um, th- then the pitfalls come. It becomes more difficult for you right. to be able to navigate. And, it, and it's harder to dig out mm-hmm. than to not get in. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's just get a little personal for just a moment. So, what was your education, Alvian, about uh, money growing up? What did your parents? Teach so, you? you guys know I am the child of immigrants. So, there's a. I don't want to go so far as to say that there are specific things that are taught culturally per se, but uh, very often in an immigrant household, your your family is coming to this country specifically to achieve. So my parents are, my father is a naturalized citizen of the United States from Trinidad. And my mom is actually a citizen of the United States. And, you know, like truly, my dad's technically a permanent resident. Mm -hmm. She's actually a citizen of the United States. So my dad can't vote, but my mom can. Um, But they came for my mom came at nine years old and my dad came um, at right around 24 or so from Trinidad. So there was always an expectation of achievement for upward mobility. And for them, education was considered the great equalizer. That is not to negate racism or oppression or challenge, but it's to say that you have a much better position if you get an education. Mm-hmm. My father came to this country with $200 and like towels and some a couple pieces of clothing he retired with multiple figures let's put it that way okay because he's always like baby everybody doesn't need to know okay but but what was very interesting is that we never we didn't grow up with an understanding of having excess we knew that our parents always found the money to pay for the things that mattered. So we got opportunities. I, I did when I was graduating from high school. Um, I got a chance to tour Europe. My parents sent me. Um, but there was still always this knowledge of being cautious or thoughtful about how we used our money. My parents were frugal. They weren't cheap. But we lived a very middle class life. Mm-hmm. I did not realize until I was much older how much my parents actually made. They did not discuss that as we so, were children. So that wasn't They did not discuss household. that. But what was very clear is that you spend way less than you make. Mm-hmm. We knew that much, but we didn't understand per se what that was going to mean long term. Mm-hmm. But as we got older, our parents started to have more and more conversations with us about decision making around money. But I didn't necessarily grow up with lots of money conversations. Did you have a piggyback? I did, actually. And I had a savings account and they made sure that they did that pretty early in Mm -hmm. our lives. And I did not go to school with debt. I ended up with debt because I thought I was grown and I got married when I was in my junior year. So (laughs) I did end up with lots of debt. Because when you tell your parents you can get married, they're like, you could also pay your bills. (laughs) That is correct. (laughs) So I have student loan debt as a byproduct. Don't even start. (laughs) What were you taught growing up? Um... Give to 10% to the church, whatever you make. Mm-hmm. Save 10% for yourself. Live off of what's left. Make sure you have a nest egg. My mother taught me how to invest. Mm. Um, that was her thing, you know, what stocks to buy, how to buy, when to buy, when to sell. Your mother. My mother, oh, my mother was the one that taught me that. My father liked to spend. They were... <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, but, like know, but they, dad. they both grew up in the depression era, <laughs> Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, their mom's thoughts about money was that it was different from dad's mm-hmm. um, because dad was just like, and they were both educators. So, you know, they didn't make a lot, but mm-hmm. made enough. Um, and we didn't, as children, weren't given a lot. We were given what we needed. Mm-hmm. We didn't get a lot of stuff. I want this or I want that. I learned how to sew. Because my parents would not buy me what was in fashion. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, so so like I learned how to make it so that I could some days be like I was in style. <laughs> yeah. I so that. I learned how to sew, which was mm-hmm. a, is a good skill to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, so it, my mother was very frugal, saved a lot. My father spent, but he never spent over. Um, our college, our parents paid for college for all three of us. Mm -hmm. So we didn't occur any debt. I mean, you know, it was ages ago when we went, but still, (laughs) you know, we didn't have any debt to worry about. Well, and back then, too, that was still a lot of money. money. Sure was. Still a lot of money. It's all relative. And Mm -hmm. we understood, well, I was in the middle and I I wouldn't, I I played a lot. But when I (laughs) went to Virginia State, I didn't have a scholarship. After my first semester as a freshman, I had a scholarship Mm -hmm. all the way through Mm -hmm. because I then learned the value of, one, what my parents were doing and providing for us that they could put somewhere else because I had right. a younger sibling. So, mm-hmm. um, so you know, so, and I have done most of that, but did I get in debt? Yes, because I paid to go get my master's and I paid a, a credit, I used a credit card to go get my master's because I knew I needed it in order to become an administrator in the school system. And it took me a long time, long time to, you to know, pay, to that, pay that thing off. Mm-hmm. Okay, so well, we have a Gen mm-hmm. Xer and we got a baby boomer. <laughs> and you got Carol. the old person. <laughs> <laughs> she said we it. Got I did. Wisdom. I we old. have wisdom. We have, we have wisdom. <laughs> what did your parents teach you? Wow, I learned a lot because I grew up on a farm and my dad was manager and owner of a 200 acre farm. And so very early, I learned about the farm budget. And one of the first things, I remember one Christmas asking for something. And he, my dad was explaining why I couldn't have it. And I said, but I thought Santa Claus paid for this. (laughs) And he said, okay, let's get real. Um, (laughs) Santa Claus has your best interest at heart. But if I get what you want for Christmas, if you get what you want for Christmas, I will not be able to pay two of the farm workers. So what do you think should Mr. Bell and Mr. Davis not get paid because you want a new bicycle? And I said, okay. And he said, no, we'll get it ultimately, but it depends on the farm crop. Now, the next series of lessons came when I was in college. And I got what I thought was a pretty good grade. It was a C. And then when my (laughs) dad came home and looked at it, he said, I'm sorry, but I'm not paying for a C. And I said, I passed. He said, not in my book. So uh, you will be paying to retake the course. And I said, but I don't have any money. He said, well, you will have. And when I said, but how? He said, it's called getting a job. And I said, but I don't have one. He said, well, figure it out because I want my money back. (laughs) 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 The irony is that when he passed, he had put it in the bank for me. So my parents, while they were educators and very interested in the african-american community there was that reality check don't think that you're privileged you are have some advantages but you owe back and you owe us and you're not going to just skate and say but you're paying for this so um hmm. that was my reality and then the final reality is having gone to law school and when i got my master's in law you know thinking affirmative action and all that. And then when I got the bill saying, wait a minute, and they said, if you come back and teach, you know, you get this whole thing forgiven Mm -hmm. until two years ago. And I said, well, I'm teaching. They said, no, that took care of the base, but the interest is unpaid. Oh, so reality, reality. So still dealing with with, Mm -hmm. with, uh, student Student debt. Student debt. Wow. (laughs) Allison. The, our youngest of the group. <laughs> so I listen to you hear you hear each of these. Uh, there's a, a common theme through it, which is education, number one, mm-hmm. and and saving and so forth. So, what did your parents teach you about money? Um, parent. So parent. Um, my mother was a single parent, and I didn't have conversations with my father about money at all. Which is really interesting. Listening to you all talk about my mother and my father, I'm like, hmm, because I can see how with it just being my mom, there was a lot of other opportunity for people for me to be influenced about people's opinions. But in, so in answering your question, I'm thinking like, what were we taught? A, money, was, debt was not a bad thing. That's mm-hmm. how we were taught. It was like the other way to get it. You know what I mean? Like, well, just get it. You gotta, you gotta put it on a card. You don't have to, when you get 18, you gotta get a card. Like that, we were taught from the beginning mm. that the only way you gonna have it is if you get a credit card is, you know, et cetera. So mm-hmm. um, 
that was already a challenge. It came into the game. Like Matter of fact, on my 18th birthday, I had a friend who had a younger parent. My 18th birthday, she came to me. This She had her, her daughter when she was 15, so she was like everybody's cool mom. We used to love hanging out with her. We could do all kinds of stuff at her house. <laughs> I'm going to let my kids go to nobody's house, especially the, the, the parent who is way too nice. You're too nice. You're lying. You let these kids smoke weed. I'm not messing with you. <laughs> but on my 18th birthday, she asked me, she was like, girl, you know, now that you're 18, can you buy such and such a cell phone? And I did it. I put a cell phone in my name on my 18th birthday. So my credit was messed up from day one. Again, I didn't know at that point that that's, this is not good. When I went into school and got my um, bachelor's degree, I had to get loans to get it. And when I got my master's degree, I went through um, my job. They paid for it. And then I still got a loan. Because mm. I thought, oh, this is a great sense the job paying for it. I can still get this 20 grand. So this is good because I need this to help buy a house, to help blah, blah, blah. So I made a wow. bunch of bad decisions mm-hmm. because I probably did not realize until I was about 28 or 29 that, hey, debt is not your friend. Mm-hmm. We, we were taught to use debt as a mattress, as a cushion. Mm-hmm. And so that was a huge problem. I didn't have chores growing up, so I did not understand. You work, you be consistent, you get paid. There wasn't consistency. There wasn't follow through. And I find even now as I'm establishing that with my children, how challenging it is for me to remember. I told y'all on Monday, y'all better wash your dishes. If you don't wash your dishes on Friday, and by Friday, I'm like, what was what was the agreement? What was y'all supposed to do? So try, you know. So I'm, I'm learning that. We also weren't taught the difference between. We would look at the fruit on the tree. I didn't know it was low hanging fruit. I'm like, oh, that's a pretty apple. I missed the tree. I miss the branches. I miss the leaves. I'm looking at the apple. So in my case, the apple was the Jordans or the apple was a new car. I missed the tree. Before they got the Jordans, before you salivate for the Jordans, have a savings account. I didn't know anything about investing until, you know, I'm 32 where I'm like, oh, are we supposed to do that for real? We were just taught that it was white people that had money. Mm. Wow. But that was what it was. It's the white people got money. So the conversation would be like, you know, oh, girl, that's white folks stuff. Because the white people couldn't. It, it just was. So it took me a long time to realize, hey, this is for me. I just kind of grew up in a place where I was settled with, this is my life. It wasn't really a complaint. This is just how you work the system. You got to work. Mm. You find an, a loophole to work the system. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I'm I'm stuck on that. This is that's that's what white people do, because mm-hmm. because that's a common well, theme throughout yeah. the throughout the conversation. Mm-hmm. Alvin, I mean, like, there's just I I find money to be such an interesting topic, um, as someone who was once on social services. So one of the mm-hmm. the uh, contracts that my company I own a human relations consulting firm on top of all of the other stuff, but one of the contracts that we're responsible for, we developed a program for the city of Hampton that helps to um, helps women who are on the system, quote unquote, achieve self-sufficiency as in financial independence from the system. Right. So we work on appropriate assessments to determine what the issues really are that are impeding this this stability. And it is really interesting to me the kinds of messages that we are taught, our value system around money. And it's not to say that there aren't real issues that make it more challenging for communities of color to reach levels of self-sufficiency, upward mobility, and ultimately wealth. Mm -hmm. But there are things that we communicate to each other, both covertly and overtly, Mm -hmm. that are like shackles around our ankle. And debt is the new slavery. Mm -hmm. So when we have these conversations, like um, I have clients who, you know, it'll take them three months on a job full time to make a good $4,000. But when tax refund time comes, and they're seeing anywhere from four to $9,000 in their tax refunds, they are through that money in less than a month and a half. I, I, yes. And what's I so could spend that money in like when we used to nothing. get yes. Like it's nothing. And so my issue with that is mm-hmm. that if you've spent your whole year living off of fifteen hundred dollars a month, how in the world did you run through nine thousand in a month? I can, I can and it's because that. I do understand why. Mm-hmm. But like it's because of all of this time you spend, and you might have a different perspective, but all of the time that they spent not 
having what they wanted. It was finally the opportunity to have what you wanted. So what I would have to teach my women is that you have to understand g- delayed gratification mm-hmm. because this money is unexpected money. That money should not be part of your budget. This is how you build a nest egg. And so that same $9,000 that you didn't even have to see because it wasn't technically your money in the first place, that $9,000, you let that accumulate over three years. You have, have almost money. 30 mm-hmm. grand. You can buy a house, spend less money on rent mm-hmm. because you actually own something. But mentality changes what we do with opportunity. So opportunity is its own issue. But when opportunity presents itself, what is our mentality when we get that opportunity? I want to hear from you, Allison, about what you saying that Mm -hmm. you can relate to what she's saying. So last week, my husband and I celebrated 15 years of marriage. We got married. He was 20. I was 21. When we got married, we had a baby two weeks later and then we were pregnant again three months later. So I absolutely could not wait until January and February to get my four or five, six thousand dollars of income tax return the first three, four years of our marriage because I couldn't get my little hoopty fix. I couldn't, you know, there were a lot of things that we had to put off that we needed or expected that tax money. I, I calculated it in my budget. It wasn't an unexpected. I could do down to the and then TurboTax. They showed me how to use the TurboTax money. <laughs> oh, <listen. laughs> I remember I cried like a baby when I when I when I went back to school and got a job and then we got out of the tax bracket where we couldn't get a refund back and I was not expecting that. Yeah, I was sick, convulsing because I'm like, how do I live without my tax return? I couldn't it just didn't make any sense. So it's really easy to kind of get into that trap. Mm-hmm. And when you're when you're right, I was always raised on we always everybody mom around us was like tax money. We all all the kids knew. In the beginning of the years when you got your clothes, you got your your new stuff, you got your things fixed around the house. Like that was the culture culture for mm-hmm. us in which we were raised in so as an adult that was what I began to kind of pattern my lifestyle behind as well it's still the culture yep because it people is. will ahead, tell don't. me they'll pay their taxes when they get their that's exact money right. back that uh-huh. is exactly and, right and I'm trying to to teach that but yes but you're also now paying me penalty and interest mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so it's better to give me a little bit each month Right. It's just really hard so, to understand. Like listening to it now, it makes sense. You right. know, and I would tell anybody that I mentor the same thing. But in that moment, it's like, dang, I don't want to pay this $40 penalty, but I got these babies to feed. I got this whatever to do. I'm going to just right. have to pay this $40 penalty when I get my $3,000. Right. Now I'm saying, I was, and that was ignorant or that wasn't the smartest. But in that, when you're trying when to you're, swim, right. when you're drowning, right. you mm-hmm. don't, you know, you're not like, well, just stand up. Don't kill the lifeguard trying to save you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another perspective. I understood, you know, the tax refund and all of that. But at a point, I was like, I'm going to really work hard. So I had three jobs. I taught at Norfolk State. I taught at Christopher Newport. I taught at Pauly Camp. And then when I didn't get a refund, I called the federal government and said, what's up? I, I'm a, and they said, but you're in another tax bracket. And I said, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, then I'm not teaching three. I'm not going to do three jobs. I'm just going to do one because it looks like it's all going back, back and I'm not getting anything back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I remember when I worked in human resources and employee relations. And then so now I'm, I'm a college educated professional. This is where I met my life. And there were um, this job that I worked at. There were lower $15 an hour workers. And I remember one time myself and my white peer, this woman, we were... We had an argument because there was an employee who came to us and submitted their resignation because she said she got a promotion. She now makes $15 an hour. She had three kids, but she could no longer get her benefits. She had to now pay like seven or $800 mm-hmm. in rent as opposed to the $50 in rent. And it was no longer worth it for her to work. And this white peer of mine, I was furious because she was just like, that. that's so stupid. Why would you want to be on welfare instead of work, instead of whatever? She could not gather at least respect this is the lifestyle that this young lady lives but in her that one was like I can go to work every day and have absolutely no money because I got to pay my rent or I cannot go to work and be with my children or do whatever or go back to school or whatever whatever and get these benefits but that's Mm -hmm. a real place that people live in that that population or that group Mm -hmm. of people are they're underserved nobody's advocating for them nobody's explaining or have any empathy and then it's like 
well, that's retarded thinking. Who's doing that? We got to mm-hmm. get out of. But when I, even in my family, the conversations about wealth or excuse me, money, it's almost like it was an insult if you wouldn't ask for money. I remember mm. when my husband and I were about to buy a house, I was so proud. I couldn't wait to tell all my family because I'm like, I, surely y'all going to be happy for us that we trying to buy a house because clearly y'all, you know. And I'm like, you know, can, can we hold 500 or 300 or something so we can get the little deposit, the, down, the payment. down payment? Mm-hmm. And it was like, <gasps> but it's all I got. I've been working with man for 30 years. Are you going to ask me? I'm like, wait, well, I just, okay. <laughs> and so then you're like, well, I got to go in debt. Like, who has money? How do you borrow? How do you ask? Mm-hmm. And we just never had conversations. And see that? Uh, and that is mm-hmm. occurring today. Okay. Yes. So we're still in that same place. And so even when we talk about, you know, know. if we, we, I need to stop. Yeah, okay. just for a okay, second. Okay, just okay. for a second. Yeah, if you're just ahead. joining us, we're talking about money in the black community <laughs> with relationship expert Alvian Lyons, Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester, <laughs> NSU political science professor Carol Pretlow, and comedian and entrepreneur Allison Moore. And it's time to go back to Pledge Central. That's okay. why we had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> to Danny Epperson and Nancy Rogan, how are you guys doing? We're doing great here, Barbara. It's great. We have some fi- exciting news for you. What's that? We are their challenge total right now this hour eleven hundred twenty two dollars. So we only have nine hundred more to go. go. Actually, actually, um, you can make that. Uh, 12, 13, because I have a check here from Don Hester in the oh. in the studio right here on my hand. Yeah. So there you go. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. So there we go. I think Thank we're going to so make much. it. Yes, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you. So I think we're going to make it, and we may have another pledge coming we soon. We just might. We just we may. Just, <laughs> who knows? I mean, you never can tell. 4, uh, 1-800-940-7170. That's the number to call to make your pledge of support. We are asking you to join our family and become a member of WHRV in support of Another View. You know, the beautiful thing about our listeners is that every single pledge we have met or exceeded our goal. And so we are so very grateful for that. We recognize that you could decide as we're having this conversation about how to budget money and where to put money and how to (laughs) think about money that you could put your dollars anywhere. And the fact that you believe in us and support us means so much. So thank you very, very much. And it's tax deductible. Yes, it is. (laughs) Yes, it's 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 the greatest thing, Barbara, when we put out as as producers, as myself, and we put out uh, content for our listeners to me, it's the ultimate thank you Yes, is, is yes. when someone says, you know, here's the money to support. Keep it coming. We That's love right. it. That's right. It's so exciting, too. And some people who want to take another view in their home with them, we also have another view coffee mugs for $60 or one-time <laughs> gift or $5. You can you have go. another. Start your day with another view. Yeah, absolutely. How exciting is that? So you can, you can yes. drink your tea in it or, <laughs> or you okay. can have, enjoy your morning coffee with it. Anything you'd like. 1-800-940-7170. There are the numbers that will go down well with that coffee as you call in your pledge of support here. That's absolutely. Fantastic. And then, you know, we are at, we have a two thousand dollar challenge. We are at what thirteen hundred of that two thousand. Yes, at actually, this point. The, right now we're at sixteen twenty. The number just jumped up right in your job. Yeah. In there. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. We are so, so very grateful and so excited about this. This is great. Keep the calls coming. Even if we make our goal, keep the calls coming. <laughs> 1620, let's make that pilgrimage to 2000 quickly. Absolutely. Exactly. Dial 1-800-940-7170. It only takes a couple of minutes. You won't miss any of the show because we're, we're just sitting here chatting while we are waiting for you to make your phone call. So we appreciate hearing from each and every one of you and recognize that the dollars that you give during pledge really do pay for all of the programming that we provide here for you at WHRV and WHRO FM, our uh, sister station. Barbara, you um, can hear the, the 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 sound here in Pledge yes, Central. Yes. I mean, every phone operator is busy. I, that is fantastic. None of them are looking at me right now. Everyone I can make all talking, kinds of faces. They're busy calls, right now. Punching in numbers, <laughs> making those numbers come up. And thank you to our volunteers for being here so yes. early in the morning and all throughout the day. We couldn't do it without them. Absolutely. And, and you guys start really early in the morning, too. <laughs> Super early. Where another view coffee mug is, yes, is, right. is quite in use. <laughs> yes. Burning it up. Lots of reasons to have that mug. <laughs> We're at oh, $1,620. Uh, towards our 2000 
thousand uh, dollar goal this hour uh, for another view. It's here coming around twelve thirty four right now. The numbers though that you need to listen to are one eight hundred nine four zero seven one seven zero. Call right now or go online. Simple as that at whrv.org. Thank you guys so very, very much. And we appreciate all of you who have already called in. If you haven't had your chance to call in, call in now. We're trying to get this done in one hour. And so we're well on our way. Thank you so much. 1-800-940-7170. And Nancy and Danny, I'll check back with you guys a little bit later uh, to get an update, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Alrighty. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. So we're back with our Another View Roundtable. And I have something I want to read to you guys because okay. when I read it this morning, it my mouth just fell open. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So we talk a lot about how to build new wealth. Mm-hmm. And, we, and each one of you has talked about education and the importance of education. Mm-hmm. So this says, um, despite this investment, meaning the investment into years of schooling and education, the racial gap... The racial wealth gap expands at higher levels of education. Black families where the head graduated from college have less wealth than white families where the head dropped out of high school. Mm -hmm. I just... Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, just just to wrap your brain around that, because in, in, dis, in despite how we may may or may not have been taught about wealth mm-hmm. and building wealth and so forth, there are also some things that have happened within our country that has deliberately kept the African American community from gaining a lot of wealth. Agreed, but I I so I at at the risk of sounding like I am negating that fact. Okay. Okay. You're talking to a woman who grew up in an immigrant household where your parents came here with nothing, got an education, also ended up on the system herself because she got married young and had, I did everything wrong. Okay. Got married young, had babies young, hadn't finished college, all of that. I did everything you shouldn't do, but went back to college and made a decision that went standing on that welfare line, because that's what it was called then. Okay. Now it's temporary assistance for needy families, TANF. Mm-hmm. Back then it actually was welfare. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So standing on that welfare line, there was a decision that I made then getting ready to pick up my coupons because this you didn't have the cute mm-hmm. little EBT yeah, cards that look like credit cards. Okay. Uh, yeah. You had to stand online and rip out those coupons mm-hmm. and be judged every moment, every moment as yeah. you did it. Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I made a decision that I was just passing through this place, but I had not arrived somewhere while standing in social services. When we, my husband and I started our lives, we decided not to live on two incomes. And it was the best decision we ever made because Mm -hmm. our household was not dependent on both sets of money in order for us to live. So we pared down our life. We, the first four years of our marriage, we had a roommate so that we can split the expenses in half. We had a child. Our roommate had a child. Mm -hmm. My then roommate is now my business partner. So we've had to do the ugly and the poor and the broke. And we're none of those things now. Mm -hmm. But we made very conscious decisions to sacrifice some of our comforts in order to ensure that we would be in a different position later on. And one of the problems that happens in our community is that we aren't always willing to sacrifice what we have to. Now, that's Mm -hmm. different than you're a single mom and you're just making ends meet. I'm not having, we're not having that same conversation, but I'm saying that there are too many of us who are trying to look like something rather than be something. So we will drive a car we can't afford to look like we make more money than we have and have no money in the bank rather than drive a car that gets you from point A to point B while you're able to save. So I literally for years could save a hundred percent of an income while my husband paid for everything that represented our lifestyle, it changed. It made it possible for me to become an entrepreneur. So because if it, if I was dependent on both incomes, right, I couldn't afford to step out right. because I made four hundred dollars for the whole first year of my business, the entire year. So, you know, that could be spent at Krispy Kreme in a couple of visits. Okay? <laughs> but I but 
in, in systematically making choices that said that I have to keep more than I spend mm-hmm. and we can't try to look like we have more than we have mm-hmm. put us in a position now that if I didn't work for five years, I wouldn't even have to change my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Five years I can go. But it was a dis- it, they were m- incremental decisions made along the way. Mm-hmm. And what you teach your kids determines whether or not the, you get that generational change. Mm-hmm. Because my mm-hmm. daughter also got married young. But when she and her husband live with us, they have their own house now. But when they live with us, she's a 20-something, early 20s. Mm-hmm. We charge them rent. a month to live in the bedroom, 700. And people are like, you don't need that money. And I was like, you're right. We ordered dinner with it. We ordered Netflix. (laughs) They watched us do all of those things because it's not about what I need. It's about Mm -hmm. the fact that real life requires that you figure Mm -hmm. out how to budget Budget. and -hmm. you have to figure out how to make sacrifices and all of that. I want to, I want to get to a point because Allison, you brought this up when you brought up the, the whole idea of the topic also, which was this mindset of thinking outside of poverty in other words in in other words taking on a wealth mindset as a as opposed to a poverty mindset you made mm-hmm. that choice mm-hmm. um you know i was a single parent um and i called social services mm-hmm. and the way that the woman just to find out what i needed to do just to even get in the system and the way the woman spoke to me like you were nothing i said mm-hmm. i will scrub floors before, before I, do I, this. I do this yes ma'am and and i and, and a lot I, and, has not changed and i yeah. and, but 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 some people don't have that mindset mm-hmm. so i'm what my question is to to the group is kind of you know what do you think the the secret is if you will to to create that type of mindset or a I'm only going to be here temporarily mindset versus something else. I and exposure. Self-esteem and, and exposure. exposure. Because yeah. I, I'm yeah. listening to you. I'm like, yo, that was my story with the exception of I, I was, I felt degraded. And when I went in and got my my assistance, my social, um, my food stamps or whatever, the way that they talked to me, I, I was like, oh, you ain't got to worry about this. I will never, <laughs> ever, will ever, ever, back. ever. Right. I will not get, and I got like $600. I was mm-hmm. like, we'll be hungry next month. Mm-hmm. I'm not coming back and getting this renewed, but I wasn't, I was not taught the other stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't have the connected dots. I knew I wasn't going back and I didn't, I didn't go back and get food stamps, but I did not know how to hold on to money, how to make more money, how to be smart with the money. So we continued mm-hmm. to struggle, but I just felt like, well, I made it cause I'm not on food stamps. Right. Mm-hmm. right. But I think that because at least that confidence piece was there, you know, I was not abused. I had a lot of love for my mom. So I was able to say, I don't have to be treated like this. Y'all not going to talk to me like this. Mm-hmm. But then I feel like that there are other people who, when they saw their moms be treated this way or their fathers or their whatevers, and they're thinking that this is just the, this is your expectation for customer is. service. Like this is yeah. what, this is the way it is. Then you don't know that that's a trigger. You don't know that you can get better. And I think that that stops anybody. I can't even think about getting off this system. Cause I'm like, well, this is how they do. Girl, this is what this is how they treat you. This is all we worth. So you don't even have anything to say. Try to get better so try for to pull yourself. yourself up. Well, Carol. you know, I didn't have a personal experience, but when my dad went to work as director of the poverty program, I went around with him mm-hmm. and saw poverty firsthand and saw him negotiating with people in social services and how they talked to him, although he was a professional representing people. And I was like, well, what's happening here? Why is this? And But on the other hand, and I don't want to interject a racial dimension to the poverty program, I also, there were some poor white farmers in the community, white, yeah. and they got talked to a little bit differently, even though they were still poor. And mm-hmm. I was like, how do you, my dad kept saying, don't racialize this, but I kept seeing it in terms of the approach to the system as a different racial thing. I also think um, in helping families change the mindset, mm-hmm. it takes time. Yes, it mm-hmm. does. And it takes mm-hmm. um, continuous support. I ran a program for the House, Norfolk Housing Authority called the ROSE Program, Reaching Out for Success Every Day. Mm-hmm. And um, we taught women and men who would come consistently, one, how to get that job, how to write that resume, Mm -hmm. help them think about what their skill sets were, um, help them to think about when you got the job, you got to stash a little bit. The system is set up, too, to 
keep you there. Mm -hmm. And so unless you're working in an environment that, like in Norfolk, where if they completed this program, they would get something out of it that would not be added to uh, their rent because they got a little extra change. Mm -hmm. It could be used to go to school or it could be used to buy that first car so they Mm -hmm. could get back and forth to work. But then we stayed with them for like three or four years. So now there are a couple of them that are on their own homes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but but we were there. I and mean, that's I'm one of still the, there. It's like the so. People First project that's going on with um, St. Paul's. Now, right. it's, it's but, it, the Bank On um, exactly. portion is what I'm thinking about specifically. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, another program where we're, again, teaching those skills, but you got to stay with but them. But you have to stay with them. Yeah. You, you can't have to stay just, with them. you know, say this is what you need to do. Right. Because then when baby come home, comes home from school and he needs this because he wants to try out for this program and they don't mm-hmm. have the money for mm-hmm. it, then how do we support them in getting that? Mm-hmm. Because they're trying to do the things that we're asking them to do. Mm-hmm. But you know this problem is not just for poor people. I mean, oh, no. because yeah. oh, they're no. middle class no. folks <laughs> no. who right. don't live living in paycheck to paycheck, <laughs> or right. worse right. yet, they are living at a hundred and fifty percent of their income. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and that's that's what I mean. That this is not unique. It's not unique to us. You're absolutely right. As just people of color, it's just that we are we are overwhelmingly represented mm-hmm. in this population. But Alvin, do you, let me push back on to you for just a little bit then do sure, you love a do, you, do you <laughs> do, no, but <laughs> seriously, do, do you discount any of the other things that have happened in terms of 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 um racial disparities you know like for instance when when the gi bill at um at the end of world war ii mm-hmm. and where white soldiers were able to come back mm-hmm. and use the gi bill mm-hmm. to go to school and to buy houses, houses. Mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. african americans were not right um and things of that nature that have have that that systematically kept mm-hmm. black the black community in a certain place. Okay. So I'm not arguing any of those things in terms okay. of truth. Mm-hmm. I'm not in any way diluting those realities because they are realities. What I am saying though is the same thing that I say about parent engagement. Like if you can show up for your kids' basketball game, but you can't show up for the parent teacher conference, that has nothing to do with the white man. Okay, that is a decision. So you are choosing your values. You, there are certain things that are unequivocally a byproduct of the disenfranchisement and marginalization of communities of color. Mm-hmm. But you can't make me hit my wife. You can't make me neglect my children. You can't make me not engage in the things that are going to help them be upwardly mobile. You don't have that kind of power. So what I'm saying is the things that we have power over, what are we doing with those things? things? Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because I have lots of friends that are high income earners, but they're even higher income spenders. So Mm -hmm. you may make 200,000, but you live at 275. We may make 300, but we live at 150. Yeah, it's a decision. A mm-hmm. So I'm not interested in trying to compete with what something looks like. I am far more interested in competing with what something is. And mm-hmm. I have the same problem with Instagram and Facebook and all that, where you're trying to look like happy and look like you're doing <laughs> you good things. Like okay. <laughs> I'm more interested in being happy, happy. and right. looking happy. sad I than gotcha. looking happy and being sad. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'd rather look broke and be rich. rich. That's right. Okay. <laughs> there you go. go. <laughs> well, but that kind of goes back. Go ahead. Look, go ahead. I want to look rich and, and, be, rich. and be on a budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look rich and oh, be rich. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, oh, yeah. Absolutely. You want to look rich and be rich. We've right. also been taught culturally, I, I think. That we have to present well no matter what. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And that's okay. true. Absolutely. Now, we have yes. to do that. Yes. Absolutely. Now, I, I agree. agree with that. So you Me know, too. So is that we, is that where the mentality comes in then where you see the 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 latest Mercedes Benz parked in front of the project. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I mean, but seriously, I, it's it, true. It, it, it bothers me, me, but that's where it comes from. But that's yeah. a car. What I'm talking about uh, is you, you mm-hmm. because people are looking at you. Because mm-hmm. mm. if you're going somewhere, you're going to park your car somewhere else. Nobody know what you're driving. <laughs> right. Except for you or who's, who will see you get out of that car. Right. But then, oh, yeah, it's in front of your house. It still don't mean you own it. True. Uh, true. True. Mm-hmm. That, and, 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 but not only that, but a car depreciates the second it comes off the oh, line. As opposed to 
taking right. that house and or buying a house right. which so will gain right. and, and, and will be wealth that that you can pass, pass on. on. Pass and on. and speaking of passing on, let me bring up one other thing too. Um the whole idea of people leaving a will. Mm-hmm. 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 Because mm-hmm. we in the community and and I'm generalizing but there are a lot of people African Americans who don't leave a will Mm -hmm. um, who then so then if you have a house or you have something you can't pass it on to properly. the next generation oh, it properly. Is a Not and properly, a but it's yeah. a headache. And can we add to the to the point that we don't get life insurance either? So mm-hmm. you've got people, I have friends that I have had to bury family members because there was no life insurance and they no. were living well. But we didn't Look bother like. to do it appeared. We didn't bother to do the necessary <laughs> things. Every person should have life insurance, if nothing else, just enough to be able to make sure that you, you don't, don't <laughs> leave debt. It's for so your funny. Family. And, and I chuckle now, you know, God rest his soul, my dad. But my, we used to try to talk to my dad about, you know, like, Dad, do we, what, where's the life insurance policy? Where's this? Mm-hmm. Where's that? So mm-hmm. in case something happens, no, y'all just trying to kill me. Yep. <laughs> or you're trying to jinx me. <laughs> and he wouldn't talk about it. Then my yep. mother knew. Yeah, you know, and and yep. you know, but you can luckily, get life insurance she, on another person. You know, I know, but the, but the point being, do it in a it's like that mindset of why not sit down, especially when your children are grown. Oh, agree. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. To be able to talk to them about here's here's what the plan is. You right. know, mm-hmm. well, it's um, some of it, and this is just from what I'm seeing as a collector. Yeah, mm-hmm. families aren't connected. Oh, that's so true. So families aren't connected. So mama mm. is going, okay, I've got three from this father and two from this father, but I'm everybody's mama. So mm-hmm. this set hadn't been around. I haven't seen these three. The other two children have said, I haven't seen these three in 15 years. Wow. But now mama gone. And everybody want to know how we're going to split up the house. Yet these two are the ones who are paying the taxes, taking care of mama, paying mama bills, doing all the things, keeping Mm -hmm. things up. Mm -hmm. And then these other three now want to come in Mm -hmm. and split the house five ways. Absolutely not. No. Mm -mm. Absolutely not. And that's why it's so critical to to have a will. will. Agreed. It really is important for families to do that. And young people. Like you and your husband, ma'am. <laughs> if you don't have a will, you, no. But seriously, you should no, well, because we you do. don't. I know. have a um, stand-up bit, one of my first most popular bits about the expenses of my mother's funeral, mm. and um, she had mm. life insurance, but it had not been two years, so it hadn't gotten um, it hadn't matured. 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 So when I sat up in there, I was like, "Oh, run this! We want this, 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 this." Mama going out in style. It was like, "Mama got eight hundred dollars here that she done paid into it." I'm like, "Oh, what?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And the funeral is thousands. Yeah. The funeral is thousands. And I come yes. from a family of morticians. Yeah. So, I, okay. so oh, I mean, I, I, I run through on this bit about like stuff we had to take off, take off them million dollar flowers. Mm-hmm. My mama was allergic to grass. Go ahead. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's price she match this casket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They got some at Walmart, Walmart. You know what I'm saying? So it, cremation it, is very cost effective. Cre- like, cremation, absolutely. That's is. what my mom it, said she wanted. Absolutely. And my mom that's what I'm doing. Doing. So the will piece well, is there because okay. like right now we're even a affected by a grandmother who passed away. It's about 700 of us on this daggone house. You know, and I'm like, wait, uh, can I, let me get it. But, you know, anybody paying tax? So that kind of thing we see and we're learning from it. But I, I know that for me, me trying to pull myself out of this trap is identifying people like you all. I'm like, okay, I like what they're doing or what they appear to have or to know is mm-hmm. a place at least I want to halfway get to. So let me go to this person. And that's what I've been telling a lot of like my peers, my friends or whatever. Go to your boss. I mean, not if you're a bad employee because she don't want to hear nothing you got to say. <laughs> but if you're a good employee, you know, go to someone with wisdom that appears to have money, be speaking in wealth, use coupons, but you know she doesn't have to, that kind of thing. And then ask, how did you get this? Or like mm-hmm. for you, I'm going to ask you after this, teach me how to invest. Y'all can't ask Dawn because I'm asking her, get your own person <laughs> who know how to invest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, ask questions. But questions. I think that we're not you're not comfortable or taught that we're allowed to be like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm 36 mm-hmm. and I say to you, well, there's a lot of things that I don't know. Whatever. You got to get past that and ask questions, mm-hmm. build true. relationships, right. read Absolutely. a book, Google Absolutely. it and pull yourself out of it. But if all your friends are as broke as you or waste time the same way as you or sleeping, that's what bothers me. I'm, mm-hmm. You broke. You frustrated. You got a dream, but you sleep all day. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
That's kind of actually hard my to get problem. That drunk, that That's actually done. my problem with concentrated poverty. I don't believe right. in it. I think mm-hmm. that one of the most valuable things that we can do is to spread that out yes. through mm-hmm. our cities mm-hmm. so that children are going to school with other children whose parents did go to college. So mm-hmm. even though nobody in my family might have gone to college, all of my friends' parents mm-hmm. went to college. So now I'm thinking about life in a different way because that what right. is normal inside of the conversation. But when you concentrate that 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 um, homogenous environment, everybody is it's doing the, the same, same thing. thing. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't rise up from that because there's no exposure to anything different and it normalizes dysfunction. Mm-hmm. So it's really important, I think, to make sure that we spread that out throughout our cities and communities mm-hmm. across our nation so that you are you have a much greater chance of not having generational poverty okay. when mm-hmm. children have exposure to other things that may not be truths inside of your own family. Okay, we got mm-hmm. less than two minutes. So give Ooh. a piece of advice to anybody, regardless of where you are mm-hmm. on the socioeconomic scale mm-hmm. in terms of what you need to be thinking about in terms of money and wealth, what do you want to tell people to do? I would say three things. One, your credit matters. It's your financial integrity in the world. Okay. So you have to think about that just you just the same way you would think about your reputation. Mm-hmm. Two, mm-hmm. spend less than you make. Mm-hmm. And three, money does not define you, but it gives you the opportunity to define yourself. So we have to be careful about the way we think about money. And if we change how we see money, we will change how we relate to money, which ultimately changes how much of it we possess. And that is Alvian Lyons, our relationship expert. (laughs) Don. I just want want people to save at least 10% of what they make Mm -hmm. and just act like it's not there because they will need it, but you want to have it when you need it. And put it where? So we save Save 10% and put it in the bank account? Hmm? Like so, we a say separate account. A separate, Do a account. separate account for your ten percent. Where you don't even see it. Where you don't even see it. Some if you can have it, bank somewhere. If you can have it automatically, go out, mm-hmm. so you don't see it. Have that ten percent of whatever your pay, take on pay is to go into that account, not the one that you pay your bills out of. A separate account. Absolutely. Okay. Don Hester, city manager, <laughs> city treasurer for the city of Norfolk. <laughs> do that too. Carol, we got 30 well, seconds. before you borrow money, ask for advice. Carol, mm-hmm. Carol Fredlow from Norfolk State University. Allison. Find someone who has or is where you want to be and ask them what resource, what tip, what one step can I do to get to that next level? Mm-hmm. Allison Moore, our comedian and oh, millennial. Oh, well, supposed to be funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> And entrepreneur. Ladies, thank you so much. I got a couple of things we need to talk about. First and foremost, we raised $3,055. So our total thus far is $5,055. And now I have an announcement to make. Ms. Alvian Lyons has also contributed $1,000. So So we are up to $6,055. Because she saved her money. Thank you, you, thank you, thank you. All right, let me tell you that the AKAs lead, learn, empower, advocate, and decide. They're holding a town hall meeting on September the 14th from 10 until noon at the Norfolk Technical Center. And they will have the Honorable Elaine Loria, Jay Jones, Maribel Castaneda, and Mona Gunn, um, Hampton Roads area candidates for the 2019 November election. So be sure to come. And if you want more information, you can dial 757-651-7548. And also, the Rhythm rhythm and Blues tore down the walls of segregation. This is an event that is happening at uh, Virginia Wesleyan University. Four-time Grammy winner, veteran uh, music producer uh, Steve Buckingham will use several archival films and photos, interviews, and recordings to talk about the impact of music in advancing the civil rights movement. That's September the 16th from 7 to 830 uh, at Virginia Wesleyan. Oh, boy, we're just about out of time. So thank you, everyone who became a member, renewed your membership, or just gave for the cause today. On behalf of the Another View crew, we thank you for spending time in your treasures with us. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jade Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer, and Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thanks so very much, everyone, for listening and for giving to Another View. (laughs) 